Down the river and through the woods, you'll find the sweetheart of Ohio. And nestled within the picturesque beauty of Loveland, the Frogman will be waiting. Hello, Nessie here, and welcome back to The Dark Side. Today we're examining the lore of the Loveland Frogman and some other creepy creatures along the Ohio River Valley. The Loveland Frogman, also known as the Loveland Frog or the Loveland Lizard, is a rarely sighted cryptid. Originating from the Loveland, Ohio area, this humanoid frog's first documented sighting was in May 1955 on a road running along the bank of the Little Miami River in Claremont County. Around 3.30 a.m., a businessman saw three bipedal creatures along the side of a road. Pulling over, he observed them for approximately three minutes. He described them as three to four feet tall, with leathery skin and webbed hands and feet. They were naked and amphibious or reptilian in appearance. Where their hair should have been were deep wrinkles and the overall shape of their heads were similar to that of frogs. As the businessman watched on, one of these amphibious beasts lifted its arms and held up a cylindrical object, much like a wand, which emitted blue sparks, flashes, and pulsing lights. Fearing for his life, the businessman fled the area. With their use of metal tools, many offered that the creatures could have been what are considered greys or extraterrestrial beings. As we know, with the lore surrounding most cryptids, there are usually discrepancies between various reports and this one is no different. In one version of this encounter, the businessman saw the group of them standing on a nearby bridge, and another version states that there was one of them under the bridge. There is no concrete information on where exactly the man encountered these creatures, though it has been said that it was around the Branch Hill exit, which leads to a community bordering Loveland. The bridge itself is another point of confusion, as its name is never mentioned, and looking at the surrounding areas of both Loveland and Branch Hill, there are numerous bridges and connectors that crisscross the Little Miami River. Though many of the sources scoured in preparation for this video say that his name is unknown, author Lauren Coleman, in his book entitled Mothman and Other Encounters, offers the man's name as Robert Honeycutt. Coleman writes that around 4 a.m. in March, Honeycutt observed three frog-like trolls kneeling by the side of the road. The three-foot-tall creatures had on tight-fitting gray clothing or had a skin texture that made it seem like it. Their faces, as documented in other versions, resembled that of frogs, though they were said to have normal eyes and no eyebrows. Their bodies had long, slender arms, and one was again said to be holding a dark object that spewed blue flashes of light. The most significant difference between this retelling of the encounter and others is that the businessman, Mr. Honeycutt, attempted to approach the creatures, but was said to have blacked out because when he regained consciousness, he was driving towards the police station. He could not recall what took place in the time between observing the frogmen and driving his car. There is also the added detail that the FBI investigated the encounter and a guard was placed on the bridge though this is never mentioned in any other source material, nor is it expanded upon in Coleman's book. 17 years later, this frog-faced cryptid was encountered yet again. On or about March 3, 1972, police officer Ray Shockey informed a colleague that he saw what he thought was an animal, but upon further inspection, it was more closely resembling that of a large humanoid frog. Around 1 a.m., Officer Shockey was driving on Riverside Drive near the Totes Boot Factory along the Little Miami River. There is a discrepancy in where exactly he was, as another article states he was en route to Loveland via Riverside Drive when he saw a dog in a field on Twitwe Road. Twitwe Road and Riverside Drive do intersect, so it could be that both are correct in their reporting. Either way, he stated he observed what he thought was a dog. The animal darted in front of his car, forcing Shockey to stop. With his headlights illuminating the creature, it stood from a crouched position. 
looked at him with glowing eyes under the car lights, climbed over the guardrail, and went down the embankment before disappearing into the river. Officer Shockey was able to provide details about the creature, reporting that it was three to four feet tall, between 50 and 75 pounds, and had leathery textured skin with the features of a frog or lizard. A fellow officer returned to the scene, but the creature was long gone, and the only thing that remained of the encounter was a set of distinct scratch marks on the guardrail. Two weeks after Officer Shockey's observation of the cryptid, Officer Mark Matthews was driving into Loveland when he spotted what he thought was a wounded animal laying in the middle of the road. With the intention of moving it off of the roadway, he stepped out of his vehicle, but the creature moved, lurching into a crouched position. The officer drew his weapon and shot four times at the unknown creature, which then proceeded to hobble to the guardrail, all while keeping an eye on Matthews. Shortly after the incident, Officer Shockey's sister drew a sketch that is the one you see here and will pop up if you were to search for the Loveland frog online. Other renditions of the original sketch have been created as well, which is why you may see some variations. Both officers received a lot of slack for their reporting of this mysterious creature. A local told a 1985 newspaper that Shockey and Matthews took a lot of flack about the sighting back then. He went on to state that people made fun of them and the city. This brings up another point. If this was a joke or to get attention, they must have considered that there would be some type of backlash, especially with the field that they were in. Did they not consider what it could do to their credibility? In 1999, Matthews told the media that he was tired of talking about the creature and that it was nothing more than a sickly iguana that may have been someone's pet which got loose or was set free once it became too large to handle. This would not be the only time the police officer's story would change. In a 2001 interview, Matthews wrote it was blown out of proportion and it was not a monster, it did not have leathery skin, and it did not stand. Weird US, a site dedicated to researching and investigating these types of strange occurrences, did an inquiry and spoke with Shockey and others regarding the 1972 events. One person they interviewed was quoted saying, Why, after all these years, is Matthew debunking the story? I'm not sure. Could be a number of reasons. But both officers told us that it resembled the sketch in 1976. Why would they show us a composite drawing of this creature back in 1976 and tell us that it looked like the drawing? I lived in Loveland for about five years, and the story is still circulating with many variations. Just maybe Matthews is tired of hearing the story and all the variations. This amphibious cryptid was not seen again until 2016 when it appeared in front of a young man and his girlfriend. On an August night, Sam Jacobs and his girlfriend were playing Pokemon Go on Loveland Madaria Road, which runs adjacent to Lake Isabel. They saw a huge frog, one that was, quote, not in the game. The couple stopped playing to snap photos along with the short video. Sam told the news outlet WCPO that the thing stood up and walked on its hind legs. He continued on stating, I know this sounds crazy, but I swear on my grandmother's grave, this is the truth. After capturing the photos and video, Sam and his girlfriend returned to her parents' home, where her parents then told them about the legend of the frogman. It's interesting to note that the couple supposedly did not already have knowledge of the creature, seeing as the Loveland frogman is considered a rather famous cryptid in the state of Ohio. Then again, this creature had only been seen three times, with the first time being over 40 years prior to this instance. The 2016 occurrence has been deemed a hoax by most people, not only for the outright unconvincing and seemingly fake photos and video, but also by the more concrete evidence such as location and the knowledge that it was potentially a homemade costume. After the 2016 story of the Loveland Frogman's return, Officer Matthews reached out to say that the two 1972 sightings were nothing more than a large iguana. He said Shockey had called him one night in March after Shockey had seen something near the Totes Boot Factory on Riverside Drive. Matthews stated that he didn't believe Shockey, 
but that he could tell from Shockey's demeanor that his fellow officer did see something. A few weeks later, Matthews was driving on Kemper Road, which transitions into Riverside Drive, when he saw something cross in front of him. He reported that it did not walk upright, it did not climb over the guardrail, and that the thing actually crawled under it. He had no idea what it was, but he said he knew no one would believe him if he didn't have proof. After collecting its body, he returned to show Shockey, who confirmed it was what he had seen. How was that possible? How do you mistake a three to four foot tall humanoid bipedal frog for an iguana? The creature Matthews collected was three to three and a half feet long, was missing its tail, and was most likely someone's pet. Perhaps because of the cold weather, the animal was seeking out the heat at the nearby factory's heated water pipes, which were used for cooling purposes. Most amphibians are cold-blooded and do not do well in temperatures below 30 degrees Fahrenheit or about negative 1 degrees Celsius. But during the time of the various sightings, neither officer mentioned that the creature was bothered by the cold, and the frigid temperatures did not seem to hinder it in any way. Matthews also retold the story to an author, but the story ends abruptly at the point where the officer shot the creature, and it completely omits that the creature was actually an iguana. Though Officer Matthews left Loveland PD, moving and working for various police forces before retiring, people still often sought him out through the years due to their fascination with the oddness of the story. He ultimately said it's a big hoax and that there's a logical explanation for everything. As of his 2016 interview, Matthews no longer gives them, stating, it's like Bigfoot and all that other stuff. I don't believe in Bigfoot either. As with any cryptid, researching one will always lead you down one rabbit hole, and then down another, and then another, and another. The Loveland Frog is no exception. Up until this point, we know of four supposed sightings of this cryptid, but if you were to look just a bit further, you will come across the story of Mrs. Darwin Johnson. On August 21st, 1955, nearly three months after the first documented sighting of the Loveland Frogman, Mrs. Johnson had a rather scary encounter with an unknown creature. She and a friend, Mrs. Label, went out for a swim in the Ohio River near Dogtown, which is an affectionately named area of Evansville, Indiana. While wading in approximately 15 feet of water, a clawed hand with a hairy palm grabbed her knee and began to drag her under the water. Mrs. Johnson struggled and fought to get back to the surface. Though she managed to get her leg free, whatever was after her yanked her below the water again. In one last effort to get away, Johnson lunged towards Mrs. Label's inner tube. The splashing and thump of the inner tube was said to have scared off the creature, and with Label's help, Johnson was able to return to shore. Though neither Johnson nor Label were able to see the creature, Mrs. Johnson was left with multiple scratches and contusions which she sought medical help for. She also had a green stain in the shape of a palm print on her leg, which took days to wash off. Investigator Terry Cloven confirmed that the stain did exist. While this event occurred nearly a four-hour drive southwest of Loveland, it's important to note that the Little Miami River, which seems to have a connection with the Frogman sightings, dumps into the Ohio River. After a local Evansville paper ran her story, several residents came forward to claim that they had recently observed a shiny oval hovering above the river where the attack on Mrs. Johnson occurred. In the August 23rd edition of the Indiana's Vedette Messenger and several subsequent articles published from various newspapers, Johnson was quoted saying that she believed she knew what had grabbed her. She stated it was one of those little green men from the spaceship the Dayton Daily News detailed that Johnson came to the conclusion after she read what happened to a family which encountered strange colored varmints in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. I knew it must have been one of those little green men, she said. I knew as soon as I read the description from Hopkinsville, we saw something in the sky coming over the Kentucky bank just a few minutes before I was grabbed. Mrs. Label confirmed the developments of Johnson's story, stating, they can say I'm a maniac, but I saw that shiny thing in the sky. 
it was about the size of the bottom of a bushel basket, and it came towards us from the Kentucky bank. We even jokingly said, guess that's one of these flying saucers. From what I read from Hopkinsville, I'm sure those were the hands Mrs. Johnson had described to me time and time again. The event that both Johnson and Label referenced involved the Sutton family. During the time of Mrs. Johnson's encounter, the Kelly Hopkinsville Greenmen supposedly invaded the Sutton family's farm from August 21st to August 22nd, 1955. They were described as being around three feet tall with saucer-like eyes and hands like claws. They also seemed to glow all over. How could she say that these supposedly small alien creatures were what tried to grab her when she and her friend stated they didn't even see the creature under the water? It makes no sense. Perhaps she was searching for answers, but the two events don't seem to be connected other than the fact that the aliens had claws for hands and Johnson's story changed to include that she had witnessed what could be a flying saucer after her initial reports. In the years since, it has been suggested that rather than fur on the creature's hand, it may have been scales. That speculation gave way to many thinking that the creature was a lizard man, and this new idea may be why the sketches and images you see associated with this encounter are often that of a lizard or reptile-like humanoid. And it also may be why the creature is now known as the Green Claw Beast or the Dogtown Lizard Man. These events were not lone occurrences. 1955 seemed to be an active year where the strangeness only got stranger. Four days after the Johnson and Hopkinsville events, a group driving through Green Hills, Ohio, saw a luminous creature standing near a fire hydrant. No other details were given about this sighting, but it is worth noting as Green Hills is about 24 miles west of Loveland. There is one outlier to this string of events, though it does need to be discussed as it bears circumstances similar to the Honeycutt, Shockey, and Matthew sightings. On July 3rd, 1955, Mrs. Wesley Simons was driving in Stockton, Georgia, when she saw four bug-eyed creatures. These small beings were described as having thin arms, large eyes, and pointed chins. Two of them were facing away from her, Another was bent over something holding a stick, while the last was facing her with its arm raised. She described the creature as having bulging eyes, some sort of cap on its head, no visible mouth, a chin which came to a sharp point, and long, thin arms with claws. Once again, though the location of this sighting is far from the Ohio River Valley, it's uncanny that the details are close to the other encounters. Could it be something completely unrelated? Of course. But then again, we don't know enough to dismiss or include this in the potential Frogman cases. As we've seen, if you dig just a bit deeper, there is always more to find. And that certainly is true in the case of the Loveland Frogman and the creatures of the Ohio River Valley. Though we won't explore them in this video, there are some rather interesting monsters that arose from delving into the lore of the Loveland Frogman. In future videos, we will uncover those including sightings of amphibious humans dating back to the 1800s and the unveiling of a case that puts into question the history and morals of lore and legends. The Ohio River Valley seems to be seeped in potential cryptid activity, from giant lizards or frogmen to odd-looking aliens. You uncover one, and there seems to be another just downstream. As we learned earlier, the Little Miami River, which borders Loveland, dumps into the Ohio River. Both bodies of water have a diverse ecology and are filled with various species of fish, amphibians, reptiles, and much more. It could be that these sightings are related in some way and may differ slightly due to eyewitness discrepancies or issues with the story staying consistent due to multiple retellings in time. So are all these instances real, hoaxes, or something entirely different? Most agree that this cryptid has only been seen in three instances, that of the businessman in May 1955, Officer Shockey in March of 1972, and Officer Matthews nearly two weeks later. 
And perhaps what makes these events more believable is that the details of each one seemingly corroborates that of the others. These three events occurred along the bank of the Little Miami River, and more specifically in the last two, Riverside Drive and Twy Twee Road near the Totes Boot Factory. The Totes Company may play a key role in the origins of this cryptid. The company itself has gone through several name changes over the years, originally dating back to the Rolo Radio Company, a mail-order radio kit supplier, which then became the Perfect Manufacturing Company, Inc. In 1942, a year after purchasing a factory building on Twy Twee Road and moving its production to Loveland, Ohio, the company became known as So Low Works Incorporated. It was then purchased in 1961 and in 1965 changed its name to Totes Inc. after some of its products, known by the same moniker, became popular. That detail is of considerable interest as one of its more famous products includes the world's finest scuba totes dry suit. The item was supposedly marketed a year after a prototype was trialed in the nearby Little Miami River in 1957. The company had other dry suit products prior to the scuba suit, including the 1955 thigh-high fishing waders and the 1956 trouser totes, which were tough, lightweight leggings for deer hunters. There's no exact date on when production of the scuba totes began or how long the item was in its development or pre-production phases. Based on ads and catalogs, it seems the product consisted of footed pants and a hooded shirt, all of which were said to be made from tough, stretchy, anti-grab, seamless rubber. The suit allowed for users to dive longer and in colder waters. In Jay Crawford's book, Underwater Work, the product appears in the appendix, listed as the Rubber Frog Man Suit. What's to say? that all this businessman saw was just trials being completed to test a new product. Looking at the images from the ads, you can imagine how the scuba suit, when paired with goggles and rubber foot fins, would look in the darkness of night. With adrenaline pumping, could a person testing the scuba suit's efficiency be mistaken for a weird humanoid monster? Now this theory may not explain what the two officers witnessed nearly 17 years later, but those events could be made up as Officer Matthew stated, or they could have been elaborate tricks or hoaxes played on the two officers, or those occurrences could have been legitimate and the officers were just tired of the backlash they received. While the appearances the scripted has made are rather interesting, there could be a reasonable explanation for what people have seen. or could be something entirely different, perhaps something dating back long before Loveland was even on the map. I would be remiss if I did not mention that the Loveland Frogman could hold ties to an entity from indigenous tribes, though as with any information put forward on this channel, it is done with in-depth research, due diligence, and respect. All of which means that as of now, there is not enough available information that has been gathered to confidently or respectfully add the potential ties this cryptid's origin story may hold into this video. A part two or companion video may come in the future that delves further into these possibilities. With so much potential and room left for interpretation, this cryptid could easily find its way into pop culture references and adaptations. And that's just what has happened. The Loveland Frogman has given its name to a race, which includes a canoe or kayak course, followed by a bike course, and finally a 5k run along the scenic river path. This is not the only event or reference the Frogman has given its moniker to. Native Loveland filmmaker Gretchen Kessler released a film entitled Legend of the Frogman, and there have been some plays as well that hold the Frogman's name. And if some of the details surrounding Mrs. Johnson's encounter discussed earlier sound vaguely familiar, it might not surprise you to know they hold similarities to the 1954 monster horror film Creature of the Black Lagoon. The film's plot follows four main characters, including Dr. David Reed and his colleague and girlfriend Kay Lawrence. 
Along their trip, which includes boarding a steamer boat, the characters encounter an amphibious humanoid, which stalks them after becoming entranced by Kay's beauty. The movie portrays an event similar to how Mrs. Johnson described her own experience of fighting off an unknown creature which tried to pull her under the waters of the Ohio River. It's important to note that the film began being regionally released starting on March 5, 1954, which is about a year and a half before Mrs. Johnson's encounter with the Dogtown Lizard Man. Oftentimes we see parallels between real life events and those of fiction. Whether one takes inspiration from the other or helps to craft an entire narrative. With all the mystery surrounding the Loveland Frogman and the fact that it has only been seen a few times throughout the course of its lore lifetime, we may not be able to say concretely if it exists or not. But isn't that the case with most myths and stories of lore? The rarity of cryptid appearances are what may keep us coming back to it. It may be what we find most interesting about these types of beasts. Edgar Slocan, a former professor at the University of Cincinnati, spoke of this creature saying of the sighting that it happens in a cycle I haven't been able to pin down. And this is a key point in this lore, and again, it could be a strong indicator for either its credibility or its falsity. Much like other creatures of lore, one piece of its tail could cause people to believe in it while others say it's a fact for disproving its entire existence. As we discussed in the previous Jersey Devil video, muddled and messy retellings, limited information, and even potentially real evidence could all sway people in a variety of directions when considering the existence of monsters such as these. And again, this could all be a cause for why certain stories of folklore continue to persist. As humans, we gravitate towards answers, understanding the why, the when, the how. And when we can't find those answers, we tend to return to the mystery, carrying it in our minds and sharing it in hopes of finding the truth. But sometimes, things are better left unsolved. In the unsolved and unresolved, we can find that curiosity again and again. And just maybe, the mystery of this cryptid will come into the forefront again, because as Professor Slotkin said, it hasn't been sighted in a while actually, so I expect it to show up fairly soon. With its reemergence, perhaps we'll fall back into the mystery of the Loveland Frogman. I hope that you all enjoyed this video and delving into the research of this lore with me. I, although I find all of the various cryptids that I've you know, looked into over the years and have now been putting in videos and found them interesting. Um, this one kind of <laughs> hit another level of great curiosity for me, mostly because I just find it hilarious that this could have potentially all come from someone in a scuba suit testing a product and it just became a whole story of lore that has no reason to exist. So I really hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope it was a good listen for you. Please let me know what your thoughts are on the video, on the various cryptids and monsters we talked about here. It seems like Ohio has plenty of them and they're all rather fascinating. I have a couple more in the works. Like I said, there's two that I found along the way while researching the Loveland Frogman and they seem like they'll be interesting topics. Hopefully if you found this one interesting, you'll find those interesting too. And until then, please subscribe, leave me a comment because YouTube enjoys when you do that and so do I. And I will see you next time. So stay safe and stay spooky. Oh, also, thank you for 100 subscribers because that was a goal of mine. Like I know it's a little goal, but it's big to me. So thank you for the support and all the love that you show my videos.